I have some exciting news for you, though. Just this week, in the Holy Land, some Southern Baptist archaeologists found 13 of these little rascals <laughs> at the site of the Last Supper, which only goes to satisfy the Southern Baptist belief that Jesus and the disciples never drank wine <laughs> nor let it touch their lips. Actually, they found 14. There was one that wasn't open because Peter, with his big fisherman hands, couldn't get his open <laughs> and dropped it, and one of the disciples had to open another one for him. So... <clears throat> Needless to say, things haven't changed. I can make fun of the Southern Baptist. I, I'm a recovering Southern Baptist. I, I, I worked for Southern Baptist universities for nearly 15 years, so <laughs> I know a lot about them. I'm not a preacher, therefore you'll not be hearing a sermon from me. I'm a retired army officer and a retired college vice president, and at this point I'm just plain tired. <clears throat> I was born in Michigan because I wanted to be near my mother. <clears throat> and uh, I have a wonderful wife, Mary, of 55 years and two sons, of which I'm extremely proud. And I have <clears throat> three siblings. They are uh, 91, a uh, sister 91 years old, a sister 88 years old, and a brother 84 years old, and they're all healthier than I am. <laughs> I think it's because they eat kale. You know, that's spinach with whiskers. <laughs> My family laughs a lot. Whenever we're together, there's a lot of laughter. Laughter is good for the soul. But most of what I'm going to talk about today is quite serious. So, okay, here's a serious question When do you most often lie? That's a rhetorical question. Don't anybody answer it out loud? I'll give you the answer. It's on Sunday morning. Here's how it goes. Uh, hi, Grinelda. How are you this morning? The lie comes with the answer. I'm fine, Frumpkinfelder. How are you? Because the truth is, Grinelda is anything but fine. But like most of us, she must keep up the false self. Because that's what Christians do. What if somebody found out the truth? Besides, she would have to skip church <laughs> and take a long time to tell the whole story of her woes. Besides, Christians are supposed to be fine, aren't they? Please bear with me because much of my talk today is going to be examples from my own life. I do that because it's better than giving examples from your life. <laughs> uh, a number of years ago, about 48 years ago, I, I did the unthinkable. I was in... <laughs> The, one of the worst inventions of the Southern Baptist Church. God forbid you ever had to participate in a teacher's meeting. Lord have mercy on us. The teacher's meeting was where everybody, all the Sunday school teachers got together and somebody bored us for an hour. <clears throat> so I'm sitting in a teacher's meeting and I had the audacity to admit to all these teachers 
that I was depressed. And guess what happened? What do you think happened? Does anybody know cliche? <laughs> Every, anyone that was ever invented came flying at me all at once. All the things that I could do or should do or should have done to not be depressed. Guess what one thing never did I hear? What do you suppose is the one thing that nobody said? Huh? Yeah. Nobody offered to pray for me. Yeah. Well, anyway, I said <clears throat> my family laughed a lot. When I said that I was speaking of my siblings, we have always gotten along well, the four of us. No conflicts of any kind, really. I find that very interesting. <laughs> when I discovered later in life was that we really had two different families. My sisters grew up in one family and my brother and I grew up in another family. And uh, so what's that have to do with the price of tea in China? Well, something happened to my father in the interim, and which caused him to be angry with my mama almost all the time. Meal times were especially cantankerous. He would gripe about whatever she put on the table. And um, my brother and I would get mad at that, and then we'd find ways to keep from there being an explosion at the table. <clears throat> my sisters were in college, so they didn't get to experience all this. Uh, so my way of dealing with this was to simply hold it inside and let it simmer there until it was a safer time to release it and cover it over most of the time with guess what? Humor. I guess you got a little of that already. I, I covered most of the anger up with humor. I've done that all my life, I guess. And that was an acceptable method, but not always the healthiest way to do it. Both my brother and I grew up with a lot of anger. We just handled it in different ways. It contributed to sporadic bouts of depression. More on this later, but there's a common link between anger and depression. If you find yourself dealing with a bunch of anger that you can't explain. You don't. You just know you're angry, but you don't really know why. I would suggest you get some short-term counseling in an effort to lay it before the Lord and uh, discover its source. Where did it come from? Who are you really angry with? Or what about? Because God knows all about it. And uh, so now let's try to tie it into our topic for today. Many years of my professional life were spent in the mental health field. I've been seen more mental illness than most of you'll see in a lifetime. I want to talk to you this morning about one aspect of emotional struggle that most of us will go through from time to time, most, most everybody in the room. The struggle has broad implications for our lives in four distinct areas, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. It is very common, it's insidious, it's complex. It begins in our thinking, progresses through our emotions, 
in our spiritual life and often winds up being acted out in harmful ways. So what is this mysterious problem that we're all subject to? Depression. Everybody take a deep breath now and say to yourself, he's not talking about me specifically. <laughs> so let me be honest here. The idea for this talk came from my own struggle with depression and not so very long ago. I had survived one kind of cancer and now in treatment for a second kind of cancer. In addition, I'm still going through a very long period of illness in which five different medical specialties have not been able to figure out what in the world's wrong with me. Uh, only in the last two weeks have they determined that it's some sort of neuromuscular disease and also involves my heart. It has drug on and on and I deal with shortness of breath and weakness to the point that I felt ultimately useless. When I take the garbage can to the street, I have to come in and sit down and rest. This led to a lot of negative thinking, and it didn't take long before I was dealing with a low-grade depression. Maybe one of those specialists should have been a shrink. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I got fed up enough, I called an out-of-state counselor friend of mine who in a relatively short period of time helped me begin to digging out of the hole I had dug for myself and began to see the light of day. Now, let's put this story on hold for a minute and take up, talk about... Uh, depression as an emotional mental disorder. First of all, there are two broad types of depression. The most common that we all deal with at some time is called situational depression. It can be caused by any number of things, such as the loss of a spouse, or loss of a job, or a loved one, or an illness, or very common stinking thinking as, a, as in feeling sorry for oneself or feeling victimized or just lonely or for that matter, listening to the news. <laughs> the other type of depression is chronic or clinical depression, which always and I emphasize always, needs therapy and medication. Why? There's a very good reason why. Because when a person is depressed for any extended period of time, it affects the chemistry in the brain. And there is no such thing as thinking your way out of that kind of depression. you basically have to have medication to correct the, the issue that exists in the brain. Now, um, sometimes the uh, lighter depression, if you will, can be helped with medication too, but it's not... Uh, not always so. But I want to emphasize here, and I will again later, that there is no shame in taking medication for this problem. I have known people that thought if you're a Christian, you shouldn't be taking medications for this kind of a problem. And that's complete hogwash. It basically comes out of legalistic belief. 
legalistic teaching or preaching. There is no shame in taking medication for what you need for your body. Uh, so if you're suffering from depression, uh, I would recommend you get to a, a professional person uh, and get what you need for it. Another issue that's fairly common along with depression that we don't have time for this morning is another anxiety. Uh, is anxiety is very common partner with depression. Um, I, I don't have time to spend a lot of time on anxiety, but uh, it's important to pay attention to these during times that, and not let them get out of control. Smoldering resentment or outbursts of rage or excessive mood swings uh, need to be paid attention to. I want to go back to a, a, a time uh, of previous difficult time for me. It was in about 1974. I was supervising a, a child guidance clinic at Brook Army Medical Center and was dealing with a bout of depression myself at the time. It was a, it was a good, very good job, and uh, I loved what I was doing, but it was an extremely stressful job. Day after day, seeing children with extremely difficult uh, problems. And one of my patients had a demonic uh, involvement, and... Uh, she called me, I, I had admitted her to an inpatient psychiatric facility and she called me on a Sunday morning before I left for church and said, I guess you've heard, haven't you? And I said, what? She, my mother shot and killed my father this morning. And uh, so it was that kind of a situation all the time. And uh, so I... I I was going through that kind of a stress all the time, and I, I was just really kind of un burdened under it. And uh, so I was on my way home from work one day, and I was talking to the Lord, and, and I, he, he impressed me with the thought, why don't you take control of your thoughts? <laughs> Silly me. Um, and so... When I got home, I asked Mary to take the boys to the other end of the house, and I went to the back bedroom and had a out loud conversation with the devil and then with Jesus. And when uh, we got through, I came out uh, feeling a lot better. And it was just a matter of taking responsibility for the what I'd been thinking. Now, does it always work that quickly? No, it doesn't. But um, it's not always a simple fix. I'm not implying that. But sometimes, sometimes it is. And the reason it is is because always, always, depression starts up here, folks. Doesn't start down here. It always starts in your thinking. Then moves to your emotions. Okay? Write that down up here <laughs> so you remember. Depression starts in the way you think about your life and about things. Well, why do I tell you this story and what does it have to do with the current one? It has a lot to do with you and I taking responsibility for the way we think and thus the way we feel how we respond to God. When you and I get caught up in some stinking thinking, whatever it sounds like, I'm not being treated right. Um, I, I don't think they really care about me. How could God possibly love me? This is too much for me, et cetera, et cetera. 
the feelings that follow are obviously going to be negative. And if you aren't careful, your behaviors will reinforce the beliefs and the cycle will continue. I can't emphasize enough how important it is to listen for the voice of God during these times. There is a wonderful quote from Oswald Chambers. He died in 1917, but left an amazing legacy of his insight into the heart of God in this enduring devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest. This is a quote from Taking the Initiative Against Depression. When the Spirit of God comes to us, he does not give us glorious visions, but he tells us to do the most ordinary things imaginable. Depression tends to turn us away from the everyday things of God's creation. But whenever God steps in, his inspiration is to do the most natural, simple things, things we would never have imagined God was in. But as we do them, we find him there. The inspiration that comes to us in this way is an initiative against depression. But we must take the step, the first step and do it in the inspiration of God. If, however, we do something simply to overcome depression, we will only deepen it. But when the Spirit of God leads us instinctively to do something, the moment we do it, the depression is gone. As soon as we arise and obey, we enter a higher plane of life. End quote. There is a time when you can be an encouragement to a friend. I like what it says in Colossians 3.12. So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, you don't have to be a trained counselor. Just listening can be helpful. Mike Wells was a friend of mine. Some of you know Mike well, know of Mike Wells. He claimed that I taught him counseling. <laughs> I'm sure I'm not sure I should take credit for that. Mike was one of the brightest Christian minds I've ever known and selfless. He died much too young taking the message of grace to places in the world where no one else would go. Mike had a Christian counselor friend from India named Alex Matthew. What I'd like to quote, who I would like to quote here. Quote, my, my secret is to be thankful for all things, including the persons who abhor me. Praise the Lord, I can spend more time with him when I happen to think of such. We need a clean heart to provide a right inner environment to cultivate gratitude. A clean heart I define as one free of fear, anger, guilt, forgiveness, doubts, shame, all that leads to stress and eventually to depression." End quote. Any, milk, any mental health clinician will tell you that Beneath depression is often another emotion that feeds it, and that's anger. The interesting thing is that the person may not even know what or whom they're angry with. Sometimes it's God, but they don't want to admit that, admit that without help. That's why counseling is important, because all of the reasons for the depression are not always hanging out there like ripe fruit. While this anger and depression is rolling around, what is happening with you and God? Everyone does not respond to depression the same way, but it's not unusual for fellowship with the Lord to drop off when one is depressed. If you find yourself feeling down and discouraged and recognize that you have been depressed for some time, it's really time for you to get some help. Sometimes our friends or family will notice it before we will. Now hear this next statement. I repeat again, there is no shame in getting help when you need it. For some, it helps to keep a journal, at least for a time. If you have never kept a journal before, 
all, all you need to do is write down your feelings and then discover what led to those feelings. Am I angry? If so, at whom or what? Can you read Ephesians 5.20 and mean it? Quote, always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. Meditate on Philippians 4, 6 through 9. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, dwell on these things. The things you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and God will, and the God of peace will be with you. Can it really be as easy as the examples I've given? Certainly not always. But if you never choose to take charge of your thought life, your chance of getting free will be significantly reduced. In both examples I gave you, I've allowed my negative thinking to take me down a road I shouldn't have gone. And before long, I had bought into a load of negative thoughts about my circumstances in my life, and they had added up to depression. So the answer for me was to say stop <laughs> and take responsibility for what I was thinking and how I was feeding my emotions. Remember this, it is always starts in your thinking, not your emotions. That's why Paul said in 2 Corinthians 10.5, we are taking every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. When you go to God with your cares, remember to plan on a two-way conversation. If you only talk to God and do not listen for his voice, how will you know his answer? He does not always provide instant healing, but in time you will find your heart lifted and you will feel like your old self again. Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. I have a summary which I'll give you in a moment, but I want to say something before I do about this business of hearing from God. It's a, it's a little story. <laughs> a number of years ago when we were living in the suburb of Dallas, we, uh, we were in a Sunday school class taught by a seminary professor <clears throat> and he was waxing eloquent about um, how the only way you could hear from God, the only way God spoke was from the Bible. You know, as though when the last word of revelation was written, God went mute. And I sat there and listened to that, and it was a pretty good sized class. It was about probably the size of this group. And I raised my hand and I asked him, sir, how, how is that possible? How could I said, do you, do you ever get convicted of sin? Yeah. 
I say, does that always come when you're reading the Bible? He, he began to run out of answers pretty fast. <laughs> you don't get convicted of sin by reading in the Bible, Jack, you shouldn't have done such and such. You get convicted of sin in your spirit, don't you? Yeah. If that is true, then is it not also true that God can convict you of the fact that he loves you without reading the Bible? Is that possible? Yeah. So he didn't go mute when he closed the Bible. The question becomes, Who, this is a tough question for you. What is, what's most important? And this, by the way, the Southern Baptists fought about this a few years ago vehemently. Which is most important, the written word or the spoken word? Uh, I mean, the, the written word or the living word? Think on that for a while. I'm not going to answer it for you. <laughs> I'll get in trouble. <laughs> but, but in other words, folk, you can hear from God without having your Bible in your hand, okay? And the sooner you learn that and the sooner you practice that, the better off you'll be. And when it comes to this topic, in particular, you need to, to go to the Lord and say, what, where, where have I listened to the wrong voice? You understand me? Where have I been listening to the wrong voice? Mine or somebody else's? What do you say about me? Okay. In summary, we are all subject to depression. Every one of us. Two, depression starts in our thinking, moves to our emotions. Three, there is no shame in counseling and medication. Four, scripture has much to say about how to respond. Ephesians 5, 10, 2 Corinthians 10, 5, Philippians 4, 6 through 9, Proverbs 23, 7. Remember your identity. You're a child of God, loved by God, held by God, cared for by God. And you can be an encouragement to a friend who's in a low place. Okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace and love and goodness to us. Thank you that uh, you have help in time of need, even in the midst of depression. Your choice is to lift us above it and to hold us up. We thank you, praise you, Bless you, Lord Jesus, that you care for us in time of need. Amen.